what this man was like even before he had heard the gospel. Now, now Peter's going to share very plainly the gospel with him. He does not yet have faith in Christ. As we'll see in just a moment, he's not yet a saved man, but he's a decent, devout, religious, God-fearing, and good man. But how are we, able, how are we to understand that theologically? Well, if you notice, the title of the sermon is The Gospel for Good People. And I put in quota- quotation marks because Cornelius is good in, in a certain sense. And then theologically, he's not good in another sense. The, West, the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 16, speaks about works done by non-Christians. It says, Works done by unregenerate men, although for the matter of them, they are to be things which God commands and of good use both to themselves and others. Yet the confession goes on to say, they cannot please God because they are not done from a right heart in a right manner toward the right end. And I think that's right. The confession distills there a lot of good theology. That on the one hand, we know from Scripture that unless you're doing what you're doing in faith, it cannot be pleasing to God. Unless your aim is for the glory of God, it is not ultimately a good work that God finds acceptable and pleasing, pleasing in his sight. That's one sort of theo- theological category. But of course the Bible is a big book, and it uses words in a lot of different ways. And there's another way to think about good works, or acceptable before God, or a good man. And that's, that is one who is, is in an approximate sense a devout, decent, or moral. It's important that we have this kind of theological nuance. Otherwise, you and I may make the mistake of thinking that every non-Christian, or even most non-Christians, are going to be some sort of seething, licentious, despicable monster that'll just be so obvious. They wouldn't possibly be nice to us as neighbors. You may think you could, you could just tell where the Christian neighbors are and the non-Christian neighbors are because they graffiti your lawn every night and they throw rotten eggs over your window. When they come out, they have little pointy horns on their heads. Of course not. In fact, we're all probably, we've all probably encountered that, that theological conundrum where we ask ourselves, why is this non-Christian nicer than most of the Christians that I know? C.S. Lewis has an interesting essay about that. Part of his argument is, You have to understand that some people by virtue and background and upbringings and parents and school and all the rest have quite a head start on on being basically nice, decent, socialized, and civil human beings. The point is this. There is more than one biblical way to look at a person. You would be very right, biblically and theologically, to look at the human race in binary categories. You're either dead in sin or alive in Christ. You are either an enemy of God or a friend of God. And those are absolutely true biblical theological categories. But we would also be right to see that in a different sort of theological grid, there are sometimes more shades of color than simply black and white. There are decent, honorable non-Christians. Call it common grace, God's restraining grace, the effects of natural law, natural theology. But I'm sure all of us can think in your classroom, in your workplace, in your family, you can think there seems to be some really nasty people, and then you think there are some people like Cornelius. They would give you your shirt off their ba- the shirt off their back, and they're, they're a model for so many good things. Yes, they need Jesus, but by God's grace, they're honest. They're honorable. And so we, we need to understand that there's, a lot, there's lots of people. And we should expect lots of people like Cornelius. Especially in a place with any kind of Christian heritage and tradition and general, a general sort of Christian culture. If not presently, not too far in the distant. We're going to encounter all sorts of Corneliuses and we should not treat them poorly. We should not change our theology around them. Either to think that, well, they, they can't possibly be decent human beings if they don't know Christ. Or wow, I met someone who really seems like a nice person. Therefore, I have to throw out the window my doctrine of, of, of total depravity and sin 
in their need for a savior in heaven and hell because they seem like they're really good people. So I want you to know what, kind of, what sort of man Cornelius was. Second, just as importantly, you need to notice what sort of man he was not. So everything I just said, he's decent, religious, the sort of man you would want to bring your car to for servicing. You'd want working at the bank. You would want as your, your neighbor next door, and yet he's not saved. He's not a Christian. He does not know Christ. Let me give you some theological isms. There's four of them when it comes to understanding salvation in Christ. One is universalism. This is the belief that all people in the end are saved. The population of hell is zero. Everyone ends up some, somehow in heaven. Universal, uni, that's universalism. The only problem with that is the, Bob, the Bible obviously does not teach universalism. I'm not getting into the detail of that today, but it, it just doesn't. Second, pluralism. And I'm not talking about the sort of good sort of pluralism where we all learn to live together and we're all very different, but theological pluralism. It's not quite universalism. There still may be a hell because there needs to be a place, some place for Hitler and Stalin and people like that, but there are many, many ways to God. There are many ways if you're sincere and if you're a decent person, then there are many re different religious paths that put you in heaven. That also is, is not what the Bible teaches. There's a third category, which is quite popular among some evangelicals. And I bet some of you, without knowing it, hold to this position. And if not, then maybe some of your kids or your grandkids hold to it. It's called inclusivism. Inclusivism says, well, yes, we are only saved through Christ. We know that from the Bible. We're saved. We must be saved by the finished work of Christ on the cross. It's only by his death in resurrection that we can, be, we can go to heaven. But inclusivism says, ah, well, but perhaps we don't need to put conscious faith in Christ in order to be saved by Christ. And sadly, as much as many of us love C.S. Lewis books, he advocates in both the Chronicles of Narnia and Mere Christianity for a version of inclusivism. That the followers of Tash were actually saved by Aslan even though they did not know it. It's a version of inclusivism. You're saved by Christ, but you may not have heard of Christ. You may not have put conscious faith in Christ. And then, fourth ism, what the Bible teaches. Is, it's what we call inclusivism. Exclusivism, I'm sorry. Now that sounds very negative, but it's just to differentiate it from the other sorts of isms. And that's the understanding that we are saved not only through the work of Christ, but we are saved only by putting conscious faith in Christ. My point is not it to go into great details regarding isms, but I'm just, I'm just giving you these categories because many people want to look at Cornelius and say, here we have an example of a man who's either an example of inclusivism or pluralism because he was a good man, he was a decent man, he was a God-fearing man. And wasn't he already acceptab acceptable before God? Well, here are four reasons we know Cornelius was not already saved. Let's look at chapter 10, verse 43. It says, To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So here's the first indication Cornelius is not saved, because Peter is preaching to him the gospel saying, you must believe in him to receive forgiveness of sins. You haven't yet. That's the message Peter shares. We haven't gotten to chapter 11 yet, but, but turn the page, and here's a second passage, a second reason, chapter 11, verse 14. Relaying the story, it says, he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all of your household. Well, that seems pretty clear. He was not saved because Peter's coming to him to give him a message where he can be and will be saved. A third verse, go down to verse 18 of chapter 11, says, when they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God granted repentance that leads to life. So God led Cornelius and those with him to be saved. He wasn't already. 
but now he is. And then a fourth verse. If you go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 5, and you may not have noticed this before, but here we have the men at Pentecost. And what do we read in verse 5? It says, Now, now there were dw- they were dwelling in Jerusalem. There were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews. And here's the language. Devout men from every nation under heaven. Now, if you know the rest of Acts chapter 2, you know that Peter's sermon ends by saying, you must repent and you must believe. You must be baptized. Here is this Christ prefigured and prophesied in the scriptures, and now you must put your faith in him. So here again, devout men, but they're not saved men. Cornelius was not a Christian. He was not saved. So what do you do when you come to the verse 35 of chapter 10? Because this is a puzzling verse. It says, but in every nation, Peter says, Anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now that's a significant verse, and it's a very difficult verse. And there's lots of different interpretations of that verse. So let's pause for a second and ask ourselves, what in the world is Peter saying in verse 35? Again, in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Well, at the very least, He's saying that there is no partiality with God. It's simply restating the fact that Jews and Gentiles are on equal footing as far as the gospel is concerned. There is no advantage in being a Jew as opposed to being a Gentile. Jews and Gentiles come to God in a precisely the same way. That's a possible interpretation of that verse. But there are other possible inter- interpretations, and some of which, which are decidedly incorrect. There's an interpretation that suggests that what Peter's saying is that God saves the un- unevangelized on the basis of, of their piety. Those who have never heard the gospel, those who have never heard of Jesus Christ, those who are not in possession of special revelation. Again, in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is accept- acceptable to him. So God looks down at the unevangelized heathen in some part of the world who's never heard of Christ and never read a Bible and never been in possession of any part of God's special revelation, and so long as he does right, and so long as there's marks of piety, God will save him. Well, of course, that's not even remotely possible, because that flies in the face of everything that the Bible teaches. It flies in the face of the doctrine of justification by faith alone and Christ alone. No man is saved on the basis of his works, No man is saved on the basis of their piety. No man is saved on the basis of their religious attendance and devotion. Why does Peter go and speak to this man about the forgiveness of sins, which is to be found in Jesus Christ, if he could already be saved on the basis of his piety? It doesn't make any sense. But then there's another interpretation. It's the interpretation that's sometimes given a name, and it's sometimes given the, uh, the name implicit faith. Or sometimes it's called the interpretation of anonymous Christianity. It's the view that says that people are saved, and they're saved on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done. It's just they don't recognize that. They don't realize that. They have no conscious knowledge of it. But it's still Jesus Christ that saves. Their piety is evidence of the fact that Jesus, despite their unconsciousness of it, has come into their hearts in some way. As suggested earlier, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity has, su- has suggested something very similar about the unevangelized, expressing some degree of an agnosticism, I think, about the fate of the unevangelized, suggesting that, that it's unfair for those to be treated harshly, as he puts it, and to be consigned to hell who have never heard the gospel, never heard of Jesus Christ. Well, it seems to me that the clear teaching of Scripture is that unless you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you cannot be saved. It would be the death of missions. It would be the death of evangelism. It would make no sense whatsoever for the rest of the Acts of the Apostles if it was possible to be saved despite never having heard the gospel, despite never having heard of Jesus Christ, despite never having fulfilled the Great Commission. It seems to me to be the sustained teaching of the New Testament that Jesus is the only Lord there is. 
and that you must know who Jesus is and what he has done and see your need of him and accept him as your Lord and Savior in, in order to be saved. And I think that the answer to the charge that it is unfair to those who are unevangelized is that God owes salvation to no one. On our part, it should motivate us. It should keep us awake at night that there are people in the world who have not heard of Jesus Christ. That we ought to be more evangelistic. That we ought to be more concerned. That we ought to shed tears for the unevangelized. And it should drive us. It should motivate us to go and speak about Christ to all. And to use those opportunities that God provides in his providence to speak a word about Jesus. And that is what Peter does when he begins to speak. As we read this story, it's fascinating. He's not speaking now to Jews so much in Jerusalem, who had, would have known, of course, great portions of the Old Testament. He's speaking to a Gentile who may, and certainly some of his friends and relatives, who may know very little about the gospel. And so what does he focus on? He focuses on Jesus. The whole address, the whole sermon is about Jesus. It's about Jesus' life. It's about Jesus' ministry. It's about Jesus' death on the cross. It's about Jesus' resurrection. It's about Jesus coming in judgment at the end of the age. It's all about Jesus. Not sure if you've noticed this, but almost every picture of George Whitfield, the great re revival preacher, shows him with his finger pointing up in the air pointing to Christ as Lord. And many of the old school pulpits would have a plaque on them that read, Sir, we would see Jesus. It's essentially saying, don't you dare come into this pulpit and preach anything but Jesus. And that's what Peter's doing here. He's preaching Jesus Christ. He's saying to Cornelius, and he's saying to these Gentiles that the way of salvation and, and, and the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation with God and pardon with a just God is to be found in Jesus Christ, in Jesus alone. Our only hope in life or in death is found in Jesus Christ. Here's the point again. We need to recognize that non-Christians can be honorable, decent, devoutly religious people. And we must recognize that to be honorable, decent, and devoutly religious person does not make you a saved person. You're not going to find a better guy than this Cornelius. And yet clearly he needs to repent of his sins, hear of Christ, and believe in the Savior. So do you see now how we need both of these truths about Cornelius, what he was and what he was not? And if we don't have both of these truths, you're going to go off someday and you're going to go meet a, a, a bunch of really wonderful non-Christians because there's a lot of them. And you're going to get your theology all mixed up. I hope parents, I hope school teachers that we're, we're helping Christian students understand that, that they may go off to college and they may find some really nice, decent, moral, non-Christian non people. And I hope we're giving them a category like, like Cornelius so they don't go off and say, Mom, Dad, I don't know what to do. I met this boy, and they're really smart, and they're really, really nice, and they've taken great interest in me, and they're really the nicest person I've ever met but they don't want anything to do with Christ. So how am I supposed to believe everything that I've been taught? Now, I don't know that a right understanding of a Cornelius would prevent that, but it's good certainly, it's, but it's certainly one of the things that we need to have in place. Here's a man, he's a, he's a good man, he's a religious man. You would like this man. You'd be happy to have him at your birthday party. And you don't need to change your whole theology to incorporate someone like that into your thinking. Good man, not saved. So what then did he become? We saw what he was, we saw what he was not, finally noticed what he became. He went from sincere and religious and lost to repentant, believing, and saved. So we first met him in the first eight verses, he has an angelic vision. Send men to Joppa, get Peter. He obeys immediately. I bet he obeys better than a lot of us would. A lot of us may get that same angel visiting us and we'd be like, oh, just let, me, let me just finish reading this message on my phone, right? No, he obeys immediately. 
sends two servants, devout soldiers, to Joppa. And there, before they're going to intersect with Peter, we find that Peter is having his own divine encounter. While they're on their way, Peter receives a vision. He goes, he goes out on the housetop at noon to pray. And I know this isn't the point of the message, but I was somewhat encouraged to read that he got hungry while he was praying. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? Good, I'm glad, because it happens to me. You're praying, I'm praying, and I'm hungry, or I'm distracted by the things of the world. So Peter was hungry. Now this, this hasn't happened to me. Uh, a sheet of animals lowered from heaven. Rise, kill, eat. The point here is about the transition in redemptive historical movement. The voice comes back a second time and a third time. And it's like what Jesus says in Mark chapter 7, where he pronounces all foods clean. What God has made clean, do not call uncommon. You've had these food laws, and now enjoy the buffet, Peter. Let me introduce you to something we call bacon. It's a gift. It's a great gift. But Peter, at this point, is confused about the vision and the voice. Until the men of Cornelius arrive and Peter is prompted by the Spirit, he meets them nec the next day. They head off to Caesarea to meet Cornelius, and he's expecting them. He falls down at Peter's feet. So here's another indication that Cornelius is a, is a devout man, but he's not a converted man. He's worshiping at Peter's feet. And Peter, unlike Herod in chapter 12, refuses the worship. So just a mental note here, for, for whatever reason, and I don't know why this would happen, if someone falls down and starts worshiping you, tell them to stand up. Because you don't know what's going to happen next if you don't. So Peter says, get up, I'm a man. And then verses 28 and 29 present the problem. You yourselves know it's unlawful for a Jew to associate or to visit anyone of another nation. But here's the new solution. God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So, when God breaks down barriers, it's not just vertical, it's horizontal. The gospel, first of all, reconciles us to God. But then, as we are reconciled to God, it recon reconciles us to one another. We used to have enmity between us and God, but not anymore. We used to have enmity between, uh, between races or ethnicities. And God says, no, you come together in Christ, you don't call one common or unclean. Peter's vision was a direct, in a direct manner was about food, but he understands immediately the most important application is about people. Before he had kind of a, you know, ceremonial celiac disease. I cannot, I cannot go into your house, there's, there's Gentile gluten there. And it's just sort of in the air and it's in your dishes. And I'm going to get very richly sick if I'm with you. And God says, turn the page, Peter. Don't call these people common or unclean. And Cornelius explains what happens. In this time in verse 33, he adds one more important piece of information. I sent for you. You've been kind enough to come. And therefore, we are all here. Now, this is a preacher's dream. We're here in the presence of God to hear all that you've commanded by the Lord. You've been commanded by the Lord. He says, look, Peter, you're here. We want a sermon. Because God sent an angel and he told me that I need to hear something from you. So give it to me. And Peter gives it to him. Peter gives his message. The summary statement of that sermon is found in verse 36. which says, as for, the, as, for the war, as, for, as for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. And then he recounts his life, his death, his resurrection, his coming again to judge the living and the dead, and then finally, like a good sermon, in verse 43 is the application. All the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Now, this is just a summary of a much longer message. So don't tell me, hey, Jim, Peter's sermons were like 45 seconds long. It's just a summary. Right? But the final point is clear. Cornelius, you can know the Savior. Believe in him. You can be forgiven by God. Repent. Believe in Christ. And so they do. We'll read more of that in chapter 11 next week. You see, Peter needed to know 
that it was okay to come to Cornelius and have fellowship with him. And Cornelius needed to know how they could have fellowship with God. And as a quick aside, notice here that Peter is being converted, not, not to salvation, but Peter is being transformed just as much as, as Cornelius is. We always sometimes think that we're hearing a message and, and it's someone delivering the message and that's all there is and it's mostly for the hearers. This is just as much for the preacher as it is for the hearers. The Holy Spirit's doing work in the preacher and in the, in the hearers in the message because it's God's message, amen? And then in verses 44 through 48 is the Spirit's confirmation. As the Holy Spirit falls, they speak in tongues, they praise God, they're about to get baptized. This is the final confirmation that the Gentiles have received the gospel and God has received them. You could, do a work, you could do a study through the book of Acts and see that there's no discernible pattern on whether the Spirit falls in tongues and prophecy and baptism. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's in one order, sometimes another. Which strongly suggests that these are descriptive more than they are prescriptive. That is, they describe what happened in the, this apostolic age as the Spirit fell more than they are a prescription that is a pattern that, we, that always takes place. But here the gift of the Holy Spirit is, is in such discernible measure is to make public acclamation that God has received these Gentiles and they are his people. I want you to notice as we begin to prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper what made way for Cornelius to come to Christ. Because up to this point, a lot of cool things have happened to Cornelius. This has been quite a week for him. It's been an amazing few days. I mean, this would have been a week to remember for the rest of his life. They would have said, oh, remember that week? Oh, yeah, crazy. An angel came and visited me, and, and I sent people to, to find this Peter, and then he came back, and he too had a weird vision with a sheet of animals, and then we met and we became such good friends, and man, that was an amazing week. And if that's all that happened, angelic visitations, miracles, he would not have been saved because he would not have heard the gospel. There was nothing to save him yet. He experienced great miracles, but more important than that, all of that, he needed to hear the good news. He needed, a, he needed Peter's sermon. There's a man, Jesus Christ, he's Lord of all. He came, he lived, he taught, he died, he rose again. He appeared to us. In his, and in his name, and in his name only, is found forgiveness of sin. It's as Paul says in Romans 12, how shall they hear without a preacher? So let me give you two questions to ponder as you prepare your hearts for the Lord's Supper. Is God calling you to be a Peter? That's the first question. Is God calling you to be a Peter? Has God arranged for you now, you didn't receive a, you know, a trance, a vision, a sheet, but no less miraculously, is God arranging for you to be a Peter in the life of some Cornelius? That God is so orchestrated, that person in your cubicle, that person in your class, that person on your street, that person at the weight bench next to you, to bring you together. You have kids, you have grandkids, you have loved ones, you pray for them. You have loved ones in your life you, who don't know Jesus and you pray for them. Some of you every single day. You pray for your kids, for your grandkids, for your nieces, for your nephews, that someone would share the gospel with them and invite them to a good church. Do you think that there's some mom or dad or grandmom or, or, or grandpa or a former roommate praying for you to be that person? For someone that's moved to this area, moved to your office, moved to your neighborhood, moved to your gym, is God calling you to be a Peter to some Cornelius? He so arranged that relationship and you are going to be the one to speak of Christ. Here's my second question. Is God calling you to himself because if truth be told, you're a Cornelius? So the first question, are you a Peter for Cornelius? The second question, might you be a Cornelius? The Lord knows Lord knows there's good Bible teaching churches like ours that are filled with lots of Corneliuses. And might you be one of them? You're a nice person. Many people would say she's, 
She's a very good lady. You're sincere, you're decent, you're trustworthy, people like you. You have a good reputation, you've been successful. People at the office like you, people at school like you, you're a respectable person, you're a religious person, you're happy. You like good things about God. You're what might be called a Christ-fearer. You're sympathetic to Christianity. You like the church. You know many Christians, but might you be another Cornelius? And though you are devout, and though you are religious, and though you're sympathetic to Christianity, you're not, you haven't really been saved. Perhaps your prayers, your dedication, your searching have risen to God as kind of an acceptable offering. But now he wants to share with you the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. Because it isn't enough to be decent and devout and religious. You must repent and believe and follow. God is still saving sinners all over the world. God is doing amazing things. And God still saves. And the gospel is still powerful enough to save you. Some of you are Peter. Some of you may be a Cornelius. As we close the message and prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, let's, let's pray. Father, we love you. And Lord, we just pray that you would, um, Father, I pray that if there is anyone here that's a good person, they're a devout person, they come to church on a regular basis, they may even go to Bible studies, they study your word, but it's all going through the motions. Father, they may be just like Cornelius, a good person, but on their way to, to judgment, in hell. Father, we pray that, I pray, Lord, that you would awaken their soul right now, Lord. Awaken them from the dead. Save them, Lord. Oh, Father, that they would have faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, that only through his substitutional atonement can they be saved. They need someone in their place. They can't be good enough. They need your son, Jesus. We pray that you would awaken them, Lord, to that truth. Father, I, I pray that there's um, many of us that have heard um, this message, Lord, and are freshly aware that they need to be um, a Peter to a Cornelius, Lord. I pray, Father, that um, the message of, your, of the gospel has been, would be, set ablaze in our hearts in a fresh way, Lord, that we would be so burdened to, to share with those that don't know your son, Jesus. We would see them as you see them, Lord, people that need a savior. Lord, give us that fire to do that, to be bold for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's turn now and remember Christ's broken body for us on the cross. We've talked a lot about Cornelius, what he was, a good, devout man, what he was not, a saved man, and what he became, a follower of Christ. And what we remember now, Christ's broken body on the cross for our sins, is evidence that being a Cornelius, being a good person, is not good enough. We need a substitute in our place for our sins, and Jesus Christ was broken for us because of our great need for a Savior. For God's glory, Christ submitted himself to the will of the Father to be broken for us. So let's partake as we rem remember that now. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And we remember the cup. We remember the substitutional atonement that Christ is for us. That this atonement was not only physical. The cup was not just physical torture on a cross. But it was the holy, righteous wrath of, a, of God that was due us. Poured out on Christ in our place. 
So let's remember this substitutional atonement as we remember the cup. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, may today be the day of salvation for some. May this week be the week where we come to grips. We thought we knew Christ, but we were only Christ fearers. We thought we were Christians, but we were just friends with a lot of Christianity. May this week be the week where we are, we're honest with ourselves, with what we really believe, where we've really been, what we really think, and what we really repented of. And Lord, may this be the week where you give us opportunity as a Peter to our Cornelius to speak the good news of peace. The only name given among men whereby we can be saved, the name of Jesus in whose name we pray all these things. Amen. Stand and sing one more song. Mighty to save, he is mighty to save, and that relationship that you have with him is what you really need. never failing let mercy fall on me everyone needs forgiveness the kindness of a savior the hope of nations and savior he can move the mountains my God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again, I give my life to follow everything I believe in, now I surrender, as I surrender, and say, Conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, he can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. And Savior, he can move the my God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He 
rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. It's Jesus who conquered the grave. Amen. Amen. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father but through me. And we heard how exclusive that is, and it does seem intolerant, doesn't it? But he's the only one that paid for your sins and mine. You know, it was a great reminder for us today that Cornelius seems like a wonderful man. And the warning to us who are here and who are watching, or may watch this as it's recorded, is to take a look at ourselves. Are we going through the motions? Do we have window dressing on? Because you're not saved unless there's a miraculous transformation. You are born again. There is no other way. The Bible says clearly that the wages of sin is death and that we're all born sinners. Now think of yourself standing before a judge and you've committed this, this sin, this crime of sin. And the punishment by law is death. But you tell the judge... Well, you know, I've spent all these years, I've been reading the Bible, I've been going to church, I've, I've fed the hungry, I put clothes on people that were destitute. I did all these great things. I spent all my time, all my money serving people. I was a wonderful person. The judge, who is righteous and holy, God Almighty, is going to say, but your sin isn't paid for. The only punishment for sin is death, eternal separation from me. Doesn't matter how good you are, it's not by works. We know that in Ephesians 2 8 it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so anyone would boast. We need to be in the court of heaven justified, it means just as if I'd never committed a sin. And you can't do that by doing works. Galatians 2.16 says, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, in other words, how you live, what you do, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. You have to be born again. Jesus tells the most religious person on, on earth, basically, Nicodemus. So he's a ruler of the, in the synagogue, a ruler of the Jews. He knows the Bible upside down, left and right, and kept it perfectly as close as you can. He says, you have to be born again to see and enter the kingdom of God. The same is true for you and for me and for any who may be watching. You must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. But the good news is he did die for us, to forgive us. And our benediction verse is Colossians 3.11. Just one verse, Colossians 3.11. And this ought to give us all hope because it doesn't matter where we came from, what our socioeconomic situation is or ever has been, what works we've ever done, what works we've never done, how many sins we've committed, how many we haven't, if we're nice, if we're evil. This is good news for us. It says, for here there is not Greek, and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all and in all. Yes. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you chose to crush your son, Jesus Christ, the Lord God Almighty, to pay for my sins and everyone's who repents and, and commits their lives to you, Lord. You have paid. You have justified us by faith in you. And I pray that today is a magnificent day of growth for us who are in you and those who don't know you, that a harvest unprecedented would begin to take place even here and right now in our midst. In the end, that you would be glorified. We just praise you. We thank you so much for our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy New Year.